Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vandermullen, and I'm the ministry director and online venue pastor here at the Foundry. I'm so excited that you're joining us for our worship service today. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat room and answer a question for this week, which was, what is your favorite ice cream? And um, if this is your first time worshiping with us, I encourage you to text the keyword at Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number one key. That will be a way for you to stay updated with what's going on here at the Foundry Church. A couple announcements to share with you this morning. First off, our wisdom devotional. This devotional was written by our amazing team of writers and is available to you for free. Um, Here at the Foundry Church, we believe in transformation. We believe that we are transformed into God's image and we don't transform him into ours. And so um, one way that the transformation happens is by being in the word of God. This book contains the whole book of Proverbs in it and will challenge and encourage you to grow in your walk with the Lord. So if you haven't picked one up yet, it's not too late. Um, You can go to our West stores in the airlock. Um, You can pick up a hard copy at any time. You can find an electronic copy online at foundrychurch.net. Scroll down, you'll find an electronic copy there. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and you would like a hard copy, send me an email online at foundrychurch.net and I'll make sure that one gets shipped out to you. I want to say thank you for your generosity with the giving of your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry Church, you can do so by going to our website, foundrychurch.net, clicking on the Give tab and following the instructions there. Or if you live um, in the area or anywhere and you'd like to mail in your offering, that's fine too. The address of our church is up on the screen right now. I'm super excited to share with you our Holy Week service times. So the week of Holy Week. Uh, So on Thursday, April 1 at 7 p.m., we'll be gathering for in person for our Monday, Thursday service. And we'll also be having a 7 p.m. online service. So if you're not able to make it in, um, there is the online service as well. And for Easter morning, our in person service times will be 7 45 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10.30 a.m. So those are their in-person times. And then the online Easter service will be at 10 a.m. like usual. There will be no weekend services um, on Easter weekend. So just keep that in mind. And in care announcements this morning, I am so excited to introduce to you um, the newest member of the Foundry community. Uh, My nephew, Bennett Lee Hopp, was born to Aaron and Morgan Hopp on March 12th. Um, We are so excited um, to welcome Bennett Lee into the Foundry community and excited to see what God has in store for his life. So uh, if you know the Hopp family, send them congratulations and to show them your support as they are um, adjusting to life um, with a new child. All right, uh, before we begin with our worship service, Pastor Eric has something to share with us this morning. In 2013, we hosted our very first pilot service at the Foundry. Uh, It was January 26th, I believe. And uh, there was a guy that had interviewed at Vriesland and uh, not gotten the job for the worship director there. And Erica said, you know, he's he's great. And so we called him. We said, would you lead at our first service? I remember, uh, I believe the first song he played was One Thing Remains by Christian Stanfill. And I remember listening to him and watching him play a kick drum, a guitar, and lead vocals. I thought, man, that guy's good. And, uh, and he had some quirky hair. And over the years, I've watched it grown to towering heights. Um, we've become friends, and, and we've, we've grown in, in life and ministry together. Uh, Justin has, has been an integral part of everything that has gone on here at the Foundry. It's been a lot of fun. I remember one memory I have of working with Justin is when he got his hair cut too short one time and and I was staring at it. He goes, what's wrong? And he freaked out. I I don't know what the relationship is. Justin and his hair, it's a big deal. And, um, And it's just been fun. It's, it's been a fun relationship, a fun season of work together, but I, that's what makes this a little hard, a lot hard, is that um, even good things have seasons. And uh, Justin is, is in, a, in a process of transitioning out as the worship director at the Foundry Church. He'll be with us through Easter, up through April 18th, but um, we are 
recognizing that this is a painful transition and we're working through it because for me there's this flood of memories of all that's gone on and all the good and wonderful things we want to celebrate and also the reminder that lives in the life of everyone called into ministry that, um, that our hope is that when we're not there the ministry flourishes and that all of us eventually won't be here, but our hope and prayer is that the church will, and it will continue to thrive, that everything we do points to, to you, Lord Jesus, and, and we are but shadows. And the, the hard part of this is that um, a season is ending for us, but we wanna celebrate and rejoice and give thanks to God. And I think the reason that we're doing this right before a worship set is because in good times, in uncertain times, in painful times, and all these things, we trust God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And today we're declaring that we trust him. The church will be great, but it'll be different. Justin's life in ministry, I believe, will be great, but it will be different. And change is hard, but it doesn't mean that it's uncertain. God still has his hand on this place, and we are not drifting from vision or mission, but we are recognizing that a season has changed. So as we turn our hearts towards worship, my, my hope and desire is this, that we are reminded that we are not here for any one person or people. We are here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that truth, even with some mixed emotions that you're feeling and maybe some shock, I'm gonna invite you to just lay all those feelings at the foot of the cross as we respond to God in worship. Would you join me as Justin leads and we worship? Welcome to Church Online, everyone. In Proverbs chapter 14, 11, it tells us that the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Founded Church, as we worship the holy name of Jesus in this place, we will seek him alone, knowing he is with us and transforming us to be more like him each and every day. Let's worship together. Come on.
be through it all. That's right. So come on, may in the space between all the things I've seen in this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. And it's true. I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to it. And I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between us thick. And I can feel the ground shape beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Cause nothing stands between us. And nothing stands between us. And I can see. Six feet. 
feet under I could have been lost forever Yeah, I should be in that fire But now there's fire inside of me Here I am, a dead man walking No graves gonna walk God's people On the way to all our evil Lifted away forever free Who could believe, who could believe Forgiven, you love me even when I don't deserve it. Forgiven, I am forgiven. Jesus, your blood makes me innocent. So I will say goodbye to every sin. so much for your forgiveness and your amazing grace even though we don't deserve it God you give it to us in abundance and because of this we can be forever free please Lord open our hearts and our minds to the message you have for us amen Foundry Church, uh, really excited for this message, and um, I want I want to put in your mind the idea. Uh, it actually came from a conversation. I have a good friend in this church, and he's engaged to a young lady named Jess. She is, uh, I think, she has a degree in like Victorian literature, and she told me this little fact. Um, she told me that back in the age of Victoria, Queen Victoria in England, that it was a status symbol to have a pineapple. And so people would rent pineapples and carry them around at parties. Now you gotta remember, if you rented that pineapple, there may be another person who rented it the week before and looks and like, that's Henry, my pineapple I had last week. And they know that you're carrying a lie. Today I want to talk about what it means to live our lives in a pattern or, or a kind of a, a behavioral track that is a lie. If we're living with sin in our life, we're living a lie. Willful, unrepentant sin is a lie. It's our life lived out against God. So I want to talk today about how we walk with God, and, and I want to use the idea, and I've used it before, and I like the idea of this, of this analogy because um, I, was, I played quarterback in high school, but I also, uh, they moved me to defensive back at one point, and turns out I'm slow and have bad instincts for the ball which is good. But um, when, you're, when you drop into coverage as a defensive back, you drop back, a lot of times you're reading the, the wide receiver's hips, watching which way they're going to go. And a receiver will run, and they'll make a fake towards the post. They take that step and go, and you, you've got to wheel yourself around and catch up with them. 
But one of the worst routes is when you see a receiver, and we had a guy on our team named Arvis. That dude had quicks. He was crazy fast. And he would put his head down and start going. And I knew that if I was going to stay in the same zip code as Arvis, I had to be running full speed before he got to his. So I would turn and open up and start running. And the worst sound in the world was a dig step where he would go boom, 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 and he would take one or two steps. Once he got me opened up and committed to going deep, he would take those couple chop steps, hit a dig step, and turn and go. And he had stopped, and I was, I mean, I was multiple yards past him, and he's wide open. Because that dig step can create separation. But here's the thing. When you take a dig step and you stop, What definitely creates separation is dig step and head the other way because the other person's still moving. So you're going to create that separation. If you're carrying a lie, right, let's let's pretend you're an English nobleman and you're carrying this pineapple that I've lovingly named, I think I named him Henry, and it's, you know, and and regarding Henry. And so you've you've got this pineapple and you're carrying him and you know it's a lie, right? And, and you know, and you, and you have to set him down. And now there's a little separation. But if you put that lie down and you walk away, now you're creating separation. Confession is a dig step to stop the pattern of walking in sin. And it really matters. That dig step really, really matters. It matters in football, but it matters more in the Christian life. What is the dig step? It's that confession moment where we dig step and stop And my hope is that we'll repent following that and go the other way. Follow Jesus and not follow our own sinful behavior. Create that separation from, we'll call him, you know, Henry. We're getting away from that. So in this series, Jesus has taught us what it is to walk with the Lord. What it is to walk with the Lord. Fear the Lord. Don't strut in your own confidence. Trust the Lord. Don't pace in worry and fear. Be mindful. Be mindful of the Lord. Walk like a child looking up and be mindful of him continually. Choose the Lord. Make a choice to follow the Lord, striding on the narrow road, remembering that all the popularity and fame eventually dwindles down. The only relationship that holds any weight is the one you have with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that relationship affects all the others. Remember the summary of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in doing so, you will love your neighbor as yourself. So in loving and and letting that, choosing that narrow road and striding forward in an obedient, humble relationship with Jesus is so important. Submit to the Lord. Follow. Don't try to lead God. Let God lead you. And today we talk about confession, taking that dig step where we stop the continual walking in sinful patterns. We put it down and we stop and we create that initial um, We break the inertia of sinful behaviors, but we put a stop to it in a small separation between us and the sin. You know, one of the problems is uh, when we talk about confession, taking a dig step, we, we misuse it in our culture. I have a confession. Is almost used in more humorous um, it, well, I would say this, it's lost its meaning in our cultural context. When someone's like, oh man, I have a confession, everybody's like, ooh, do tell. And they lean in. Why? They do that because, honestly, um, like, I'll tell you this, I have a confession. And I think some of you guys are going to judge me, and I don't care. It's fine. J- judge on. That's fine. But don't tell me about it because it will hurt my feelings. But, um, but here's my thing. I really like HGTV, and I like the show Love It or List It. I do. I like Hillary. Hillary Farr, the designer. I think she's awesome. She's British. And she talks down to the snarky little real estate agent, David, who secretly I root for because it seems like Hillary always wins. She has the, she has the trump card of always having the people's home with the memories. And she makes it beautiful like they dream. And, and even though David shows them a perfect house, they always end up choosing to love it, not list it. David seems dejected. I love the show. It's a confession. Judge me if you must. But when I say I have a confession and I say I love HGTV, you're like, oh, man, you're a nerd. You know, you have those things. We'll have people say I have a confession. I'm a total shopaholic. I have a confession. 
I'm a Lions fan. And we're all like, whoa, you don't just say that out loud without a bag over your head. <laughs> That's not appropriate. But um, anyways, like you say, I have a confession. And you throw out something that really isn't, well, it's not a confession. It's not a pattern of sin. But we need to take it seriously. The world will tell you that... Um, that, that you really don't have anything to confess, that there's nothing, uh, you have nothing to be ashamed of. There's no vice or thing going on in your life that needs to be confessed. Actually, that bad habit, that's just you. That's just your personality. It, what, it's what makes you, you live into it, right? Lean into your, yourself and become your true self. I want to tell you, your true self is not who you want to become. You want to become like Christ. And the reality is the world will say, that being convicted of sin is humorous or kind of funny, having a conscience. But the world doesn't take it seriously. But that's because they hate God. This world is opposed to the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ we, we call Savior and Lord. So since they're opposed to it, then we need to remember that we don't take their definition of confession as orthodoxy in our life. We know that we need to, we need to value confession in the way we live. Proverbs, uh, this past week you read in devotions, Proverbs 14, 9. Fools are a mock at making an amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Fools mock making amends or making right a sinful behavior, but goodwill is found among the upright. Proverbs 28, 13 says it this way. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I think this is interesting because um, it's very true. It's very true. The one who confesses their sin and renounces them, a dig step, confession, right? Getting that foot in the ground, stopping. But then, what does it say next? Renounces them, heads the other way, repents of them, and follows the law. For the Old Testament, it would have been the law of God. But for us in the, in the age of Christ, we know it's following Christ and the Spirit of God, according to the biblical witness, how we should live. That dig step of stopping, but then renouncing and repenting and following God. They find mercy. It doesn't mean their sin wasn't real. It means that there's compassion and forgiveness in spite of their sin. Hiding sin generally feels like a good idea, right? When, when you hide sin. I remember um, a number of times, I don't know why we had rock fights when I was little, but we'd all throw, it was, we lived in the high desert, so there's just a lot of rocks around. And either a window got broken or Jeff Duncan's big forehead got hit. I mean, that happened a number of times where people got hit and you got in trouble. And, um, and I remember whenever something went wrong, what I would do is I would run and I would hide. I would hide. I was scared. And, it, and it's true. Hiding sin seems like a good idea because we look good to other people. We, we don't look like we did anything wrong. My mom comes home, Eric, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm doing great, Mom. Why are you sweating? I don't know, maybe I have a fever. Like, I'd be so scared, but I'd be trying to hide my sin and look good, even though I knew something was wrong. But here's the deal. When we hide our sin, it leaves us trapped. But if we simply bring it to God, if we bring our sin to God, we find love, we find mercy, and then this is the thing. We find healing. The further you get away from that thing you carried, the healthier you become spiritually and emotionally. We will find forgiveness when we confess. We will find God's grace and his mercy and forgiveness when we confess. We will find freedom when we confess. It all depends, really, on whose opinion you value most, whose opinion matters most, the world's opinion and how you look on the outside or God's opinion of you and what's going on on the inside. What is God speaking on the inside? Let's look at what Jesus taught the week before the crucifixion. Matthew chapter 21, we find the story of the week before um, Jesus is um, crucified. And a lot of things go on. I heard a pastor just recently say, um, 
he was talking about Jesus this week, and then he packed it full. Like in the very first week when it's Palm Sunday uh, this weekend, so when we come and we have Palm Sunday, we know this is the week where Jesus came in riding on a donkey as, as a messianic prophecy fulfilled, and, and the people were seeing Hosanna, which is, which is praising the king, and they think, oh my goodness, this is the moment of Israel's redemption that we're gonna, their mind, it was kick Rome out, and we are gonna have a Messiah on the throne. They were very excited. So they were shouting Hosanna and laying palm branches and their cloaks down. And Jesus rode in to the city on a donkey. And it was this huge moment in Jewish history. All these prophecies being fulfilled. So we have the triumphal entry. Then Jesus goes into the temple. He fashions a whip out of three cords and he starts wailing on the money changers and the, and the marketplace of the temple and he's throwing tables over and he's saying, do not make my father's house into a den of thieves. It is to be a house of prayer. You're making it into a market and he just throws their tables over and he really ticked a lot of people off there. Jesus made a lot of enemies. Then Jesus looks at a fig tree out in the distance. This is in the same like couple day span. He sees a fig tree and it's full of leaves and beautiful and Jesus goes up to get a piece of fruit off of it and there's no figs and he curses it. And the fig tree withers and dies when they come back the next day. It's just, ah, it's all slumped over and dead because it had no fruit. Then the authority of Jesus is being questioned, and Jesus is teaching during this time some really difficult teachings. He's laying out, and in Matthew 21, verses 23 to 31, or 28 to 31, um, we find this scripture. What do you think? Jesus is saying this, by the way. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. The son replied, I will not. But later on, he changed his mind. And he went. So he went and worked. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And his other son answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did did the father Um, did the father's bidding. Which of the two was obedient? Which one did what the father desired? The first is how they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you. So remember, he's talking to the religious elite right now, the, the Jewish hierarchy. He's talking to them, and these are his words. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors, the Benedict Arnold turncoats, betrayers of Jewish society have come to Christ and received forgiveness and they are following him. And so Jesus says this, I mean the two worst people is who he points out. I tell you that tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. They are coming into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to you to show you the way of righteousness, which what was John's baptism? It was a baptism of confession and repentance of sin, of laying sin down, confessing sinful behaviors. So he says, John came to you, showed you the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes, they believed And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So here's the deal. It doesn't matter how you start. It doesn't matter if you have it all together. It matters how you finish. Remember in our Kings of Judah series, that was the theme. Some kings started out good, but it doesn't matter how you start. It matters how you finish. Where is your heart at the end of things? Maybe you didn't listen to the Lord earlier in your life. Maybe you didn't respond when the calling of God came and you resisted it and you fell into different things and you walked in sin willfully, carrying it with you proudly wherever you went as though it was a decoration to bring you honor. Maybe you did that. Maybe that was part of your life when you were younger and you've come to a moment of of like confession Because right now when we face confession, when we look at what it means to confess, you may be holding patterns of sin very close to you right now and there's something inside of you that literally feels like it's on fire and you're wondering what to do with it. Going back to Jesus with it, taking that dig step and setting it down, 
leaving it at his feet is of far greater importance than you showing up to church and looking good for all of us. Looking good for all of us. Like, wow, look at them. They look like nice people. They got it together. Here's the deal. No, we don't. We all need to be taking that dig step and confessing our sin and not just laying it over a broad thing, forgive us all our sins. No, God's dealing with some of us very particularly on very real clear things. The laser focus of the Spirit of God is burning a hole in some of us right now. We need to listen to that. We need to own the fact that there is something we're carrying that is not pleasing to God. And it's of far greater importance that you deal with it now than to look the part for us. There's nothing you can look like in front of me or any other Christian that will get you into heaven. Looking the part here is not the goal. Being in Christ is the goal. Remember what was taught uh, a week ago, how, how I said, hearing and doing are two different things. Don't just feel the conviction of the Spirit. Confess your sin. Take that dig step and set it down. Repent of your sin and live differently. Walk away from that sin. Confess and repent for one reason, to maintain a soft heart towards God. I want you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine being at, um, I don't know if you like uh, Jane Austen. I do. And uh, in Pride and Prejudice, there's this Oh, yeah, it's just this beautiful estate uh, Mr. Darcy owns. And um, I think it's, it's Pemberley, right? Oh, what's that? Pemberton? Yeah, that's right. Okay, sorry. I got a little help from the crowd there. Um, so Pemberton, it's just gorgeous estate. I want you to imagine with me being in the great room at Pemberton, right, with all these people. And a week before, you had been there too, and you had rented a pineapple. And not just any little diseased, small, dull pineapple that had been plucked off a plant and put into a ship to slowly ripen. No, I'm talking one of the big ones, one of the chunky little, like, you know, fatties, and you, and you had to hold them and, like, kind of brace your other arm because you had a pineapple and had a big sprig sticking off the top, and, and you walked around Pemberton, at a party, Ooh, hello, you know, and you're like, oh, it was just a pineapple. And you're so proud, and people are like, oh, look at him. Look at him in his glorious piña, right? Look at that thing. It's amazing. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, and, and you go back, and the next day you return your rented pineapple to the guy. Hey, brought your pineapple. No dings, no dents. Do I get my security deposit back? Boom. They give you your deposit. Great. The next weekend, you're, you're invited to Pemberton again, and you're like, oh, man, Okay, I, I'm going to send a telegram, I don't know, whatever, to, to the pineapple rental agency. So you go on pina.com and you're like, oh man, I've tried pina, piniaosity, all the little pineapple sites and I can't get a pineapple. There's nothing I can do. So I just have to go to this event, pineapple free. Now I've got to make up a story. Well, we had a pineapple party and we ate him. Because that was a thing back then. If you could serve a pineapple, it was this huge thing. So just imagine with me, you go in lowly and ashamed because you don't have a pineapple. You walk in in nothing but a beautiful suit and a nice top hat. Take your hat off. Give it to the person. You greet the people and you walk in and you see someone across the room carrying your pineapple from last week. And you make eye contact. And he knows that it was yours because he saw you last week. You're like, but guess what? You know it's a lie, and so does he. But you're willing to keep up the facade hoping that no one else knows. Here's the thing. In church, we do this all the time. We look at each other and we know there's sin going on. We know there's things going on in each other's life. We know there's addictions and, and betrayals and things going on, but we look at each other and go, are you just gonna play fair here? All right, keep the status quo. Here's what I want. I want no status quo. Let's name it. Let's be right out there. Let's confess and repent for the real thing, to maintain a soft heart towards God. Stop carrying the lie. Put it down and walk away from it. Confession is half the work. Bring it into the light. Bring it into the light. Just, just set it down and walk away. And you think that's hard. I know because it's a part of your life. It's the road you've walked. The neurological pathways of your brain are wired to want that sin. 
But guess what? That is a natural problem. We have a supernatural solution to it. Agree with God about it. Agree that it's sin. Agree that it cost Jesus Christ his death on the cross for you to be liberated from it, not for you to justify carrying it. And that you want it no more, no more. Take that dig step, confess it, and walk. Walk the other way. Live a life transformed into the image of Jesus, not a life demanding that Jesus accept your willful, unrepentant sin that he died to forgive. This will allow your heart to get soft before God because when you're in your moment of need for whatever thing you've been carrying, you have only to turn to him. He will be your comfort and your guide in this journey. That is the great thing. A soft heart, and and it does, honestly, when we let go of our sinful patterns, it's who we've been. It's what we do. For some of us, it's how we've had intimacy or connection or how we've numbed the pain or whatever. And now we have none of that. And we stand there going, what do I do? And you feel like your heart's broken? That's actually a beautiful place. Do you know why? Because a soft heart the Lord can mold. A hard and bitter heart that refuses to acknowledge sin is something God won't work with. He won't force you to change. He will call you. He will call you to change. And not only can God work and mold a soft heart, a soft heart can hear the Spirit of God calling you. Sin will shame you and condemn you, tell you you'll never make anything out of yourself. But a soft heart can hear when the Spirit of God says, you don't want to do that again. Remember where that road led? Walk away. Walk away, and the Spirit prompts us and protects us. A soft heart can hear from God. Close with this, Proverbs 28, 14. Blessed, blessed is the one who always trembles before God. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God. But whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Friends, I kind of feel like Moses. On one side, there is blessing. On another side, there is a curse. I can present it no more clearly. You can carry the lie to your own trepidation and agony, or you can set it down, go through the hard, hard part of being discipled, reformed, and transformed into the image of Christ. It is a process. There is pain, but friends, there is peace and joy. I hold before you two things, blessing and turmoil. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. And using the words of Joshua who would succeed Moses, choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve the appetite of sin in your life or will you do as Joshua said? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The answer comes in the life you live. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we embrace it and we grab onto it. And we hold on with the hope that comes only from people who know their sins, oh, the bliss, are held against them no more. We do not hold our sins anymore. They have been forgiven us and removed as far as the east is from the west. And for that, Lord Jesus, we just confess. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sin 
one who always trembles before the Lord. I love that. I love that image. A person who knows who God is and a person who knows that he is to be feared. But he's also in love with us. He loves us. He is love. That he is for us, not against us. And his desire is to root sin out of us in order that we can be remade into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, whom he loves. Friends, I invite you. I invite you to wrestle with that thing that you're carrying, that lie that comes with you everywhere. I'm not saying it's easy to walk away from. I'm not saying it's, it's easy to not run back to. Those sinful patterns run deep in us. But there is something deeper still. The image of God was woven into you in your mother's womb. You are made in the image of God. And he is calling forth that which he put into you to come out and give glory to him. It will only do so as we will. We have to, by our own will, lay our sin down at the cross and walk away. Take that dig step. Whatever it is, whomever you're with right now, if there's something inside of you that's burning, turn, confess to one another, pray for one another, be restored in Christian relationship, and know this, that if he is for us, who can be against us. Grace and peace to you and take this final blessing as you, go, as you go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face shine upon, to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, have a blessed week as you go about this life, laying down your sins and taking up the very image of him who you call Savior and Lord. Thank you for joining us for our worship service today. 
I hope that the words that Pastor Eric shared this morning will encourage and challenge you to grow in your walk with the Lord. Uh, If you'd like to pray with somebody this morning or have a prayer request, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number three key and somebody on our prayer team will get back with you shortly. That's all I've got for you this morning. Don't forget that this week Thursday is our Monday Thursday services and next week Sunday um, is our Easter services and there will be no Saturday or Monday night services. All right, other than that, I hope you guys all have a great day and we look forward to having you join us this coming Thursday.